Hello, and welcome to the next part of our chapter a day series going through the book of Genesis. I hope you've been following along with us as we've been seeing God unveiling his plan and revealing to us his nature and his character. Last time we were following Abram and seeing how God was expanding the promise that he had given to Abram. We also saw how his nephew Lot had traveled away from Abram and had gone down into the plains, down into the Jordan Valley and to the cities of the plains, to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We are going to pick up from that point. Some years have now passed from the point when Lot left Abram. Abram is trusting in God's promise, seeing his area expand as he rests in God's promise, waiting to see how God is going to fulfill that promise in terms of those coming after him, in terms of offspring, because as we ended in our last video, there is still the physical reality that Abram has no children. So let's start in Genesis chapter 14. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arioch, king of Eleazar, and Shadarlomer, king of Elam, and the title king of Goim. These kings made war with Bera, king of Sodom, Beersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemberer, king of Zibon, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. And all these forces joined together in the valley of Siddim, that is, the Salt Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedorlomer, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedorlomer and the kings who were with him came and defeated the Raphaim in Adasheroth Karnaim, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shava Kiriathim and the Horites in their hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, on the border of the wilderness. And they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazaron Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboin, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Zidim with Chedorlomar, king of Elam, Tidal, king of Goim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Eleazar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Zidim was full of Bitium pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell into them, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. So what we have in the beginning of this chapter is we have a bit of the history of the region where Abram and Lot are living. What we have is basically the struggle between human beings fighting for power. So we have on one side, we have a king off into the east, and he has come into the region of Canaan, and he has defeated and subjugated many of the small city-states that are in the Jordan Valley and surrounding region. And they are now vassals to this king and must pay him tribute. His empire is actually very large. And his name is Shedor Lema. Now, we're told that for 12 years, the kings that he subjugated, all the little city-states down through the Jordan Valley, including 
the city-state of Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities in the plains where Lot had moved to, they are all vassal kings of him. But then after 12 years, they rebel. They decide to unite together and figure that they're strong enough that they can then hold off any retaliatory threat from Shadalomar. So we have five kings in the plains, but we are told that after 13 years, after this rebellion, the Shadalomar gathers three other kings from his region and allies with them, and he has a retaliatory attack on the kings of the plains. And in a massive battle, they meet, and he defeats them and sets them fleeing. He then goes into the region now that he's defeated these kings, now that he's broken their armies, and as was the practice of the time, he loots the region. He gathers all the possessions he can as tribute to take back and to cover just the practical expenses of warfare as well. He takes a large number of hostages that will become slaves for his forces as rewards for those who have fought for him. So we have this massive defeat in the plains, the city kings of Sodom and Gomorrah are among those that are defeated. And we hear, after reading through this historical account of these conflicts that are happening, we discover that Lot lived in Sodom. So he who had moved to the plains near Sodom during this interim time had now transitioned and actually had become part of the city of Sodom. The city that we were told the men were very wicked, great sinners in the Lord's sight. Now Lot lives among them. And living among the people of Sodom, he now has become one of the enemies of Shadalomar and Lot becomes one of the captives one of the hostages, one of those who will be taken as a possession by the victorious kings when they defeat the kings of the plains. And it's this moment that the account becomes significant into our narrative about Abram. So let's continue. Verse 13. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshol and Anar. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobath, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions, and the women and the people. So we get a, another picture of Abram. We read in the account that Lot, who had been living in Sodom, has been taken captive. Not only him, but all his possessions, all his family, all his servants, they have been taken. And when the word comes to Abram, what has happened, Abram intervenes. So this king and his allies who had defeated the five kings of the plains, this mighty king, as he is returning back to the east, heading toward Damascus, 
Abram pursues him. Abram with an army from his own household. He doesn't depend on the other clans or other tribes in the land, the Canaanites. This is personal for Abram. He calls upon his own, those who are part of his house, those who are loyal to him. There's powerful imagery here of the one who pursues, who the one who goes after, the one who has taken the helpless captive. We have this picture here of the Savior, the Savior who has the power to overcome the adversary, to break the chains, and to re return the captives free. And he does. In a beautiful military strategy, he overcomes the army and defeats them. Why? We know ultimately that he is successful because the Lord is with him. Knowing that Abram calls upon the name of the Lord, we know that Abram likely is dependent on the Lord and has moved in the actions as the Lord has directed him. The Lord is with him. Then we come to the next part of the story, and there's important things to see here as well. After his return from the defeat of Shadr Lomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. So as Abraham is returning from his victory, he is met by two. By two kings. The king of Sodom and the king of Salem. Now we know that Sodom was a place of great sin. Sodom was a place of great wickedness. And we hear Salem, Salem, which means peace. So as Abram is returning from his act of redemption, as Abram is returning as the savior of these people, defeating the one who had enslaved them, he is met by two kings. One is the king of sin, and one is the king of peace. And let's look at what happens. They meet him in the valley, in the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem. It's also important to note here that the name Melchizedek means righteousness. So righteousness, the king of peace. Righteousness, the king of peace, comes to Abram and it says, he brought out bread and wine. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So we see the picture of this king, the king whose name means righteousness, who comes from peace, and he brings to Abram bread and wine. We can't help but think of the pictures that are being brought forth here. Here is the king who his name is righteousness, who is a king over peace, and he brings to Abram bread and wine. The pictures here of one who will come as the king of righteousness, the picture here of one who will rule over peace, one who brings the bread and the cup as pictures of his own body and blood. 
That is the picture here. And we see how Abram responds to these two kings. As he hears the blessing, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. When he blesses Abram, the real blessing is to the Lord. The real praise is to the Lord. The king righteousness, the king over peace, knows that the praise goes to the Lord, not to man. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So Abram, recognizing this king, takes of all that Abram has won and gives to the king of Salem, gives to Melchizedek a tithe, a tenth of what he has. Now notice the next part. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. So while Melchizedek, king of Salem, points Abram, reminds him again, who deserves the praise? Who deserves the glory and the honor? It's the Lord God who is with Abram, who made it possible for Abram's victory. He's the one. So while the king of peace directs Abram's thoughts to the Lord. The king of Sodom, the king of sin, says to him, Here, give us the people back. But all the spoils, all those people's possessions that were taken, you can have that. Look, we, we, we just want to have a, a good relationship with you. So here, reward yourself. Reward yourself. But Abram has first met with righteousness, has first worshipped with the king of peace, has shared the bread and the wine with him. And so this is Abram's response to the king of Sodom. I have lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. Abram sees through what sin offers, sees through what the king of Sodom offers and says, I have already pledged to the Lord, to the one that we just worshipped, I just with the king of righteousness I worshipped, that I would not take anything, and not a thread, not a sandal strap, nothing from you, lest you be able to say, it's I who made Abram great. That will not happen. Because I, if I am great, I am great because the Lord is with me, not because of you. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten, and the share of the men who went with me. Let Anna, Eschol, and Mamre take their share. What a picture that we have of this. What an amazing picture. As Abram seeks to deliver Lot, Lot who has put himself in the position of sin and made himself a captive, enslaved by this king. And then when they thought they could rebel, then the king comes and increases the captivity upon them, which is what sin does to us. It is enslavement after enslavement. And Abram, powered by God, rescues Lot frees him from his captivity. And as he's returning home in victory, he is met by these two kings. He's met by the power of sin and by the power of righteousness. And because Abram seeks righteousness, because Abram first met with the king of peace, shared the bread and the cup with him, because he first spoke with him and heard the king of peace give praise to the Lord, 
and set his attention on things above, Abram was prepared to deal with the king of sin and to say, I will not take what you would offer me. I will not be distracted by these things, lest you say, now you are beholden to me. Because I know if I am great, I am great solely because the Lord has done this to me. He has done this for me. There's so much in here. As we meet this character, Melchizedek, whose name means righteousness, the king of peace, who is the priest of the Most High God. And he blesses Abram. Abram, whose descendants will become priests, whose descendants will become kings, whose descendants will become prophets to the Lord, are now blessed by this one who is a picture of, of our king of righteousness, who is a picture of the one who brings us peace, whose kingdom is peace, Jesus Christ. It's an amazing piece of history. It's an amazing picture of our own lives as we walk with God. I hope this chapter has encouraged you. I hope it's got you thinking. I hope it's causing you to go back to the word and look at it again because there's so much here. And as we know in the New Testament, we hear more about Melchizedek and how we're told that Christ, his priesthood, is a picture of the priesthood of Melchizedek, which was not like the Aaronic priesthood. It was not like that, but it was one defined by God himself, not passed on generation to generation, but because of the role that he was called to fill. I hope that you will watch our next video. You'll be looking for it tomorrow. And as always, we'd love to hear your feedback. And if this blesses you, please share it with somebody else. Thank you. And God bless.